me and the team are just so incredibly, incredibly grateful um, to our next speaker that he has given up his Saturday morning um, to come and talk to us. David just gave him um, a bit of a trail. Um, so our next speaker is the amazing Professor David Nutt. Um, he has written over 40 books and a thousand papers, which kind of makes me want to lie down just thinking about it. I don't know how he's done it. Um, he's recently published a book called Psychedelics, and I think today he's going to give us a bit of a taster of that book in terms of um, psychedelics and maybe how that might really be hopefully going to make a bit of a change for things in terms of the treatment of OCD. So should we give him a huge, huge, huge round of applause? Oh, well, it is great to be here. Um, if I could put that, get that down somehow. Maybe not. Maybe you'll just have to uh, look over me then. Um, can you hear me all right? I'm just checking. The, it's just good. Um, oh. So I'm here because um, of a man called Nick Siru. Is Nick here? Where's Nick from Orchard Charity? Oh, I think he's speaking to you later. So... Uh, it was about three years ago that uh, Nick uh, introduced me to the Orchard uh, Charity and um, asked if I'd be interested in thinking about the use of psychedelics, particularly OCD. I've actually not heard of the Orchard Charity, but as a psychiatrist for a long, long time, and I have to say the reason I've got so many publications is because I'm just very old, but, um, <laughs> and I've obviously been treating people with OCD you know, for nearly 40 years as a psychopharmacologist, psychiatrist, but um, I hadn't heard of his charity and I hadn't really thought at that point much about the utility or the possible utility of psychedelics for OCD, although as I'll show you there was one study back in 2006 which sort of was interesting but not very uh, well done. Uh, and Nick said, look, we give out grants, so if you write a decent grant application, there's a chance that Orchard Charity would fund you to do a, a project uh, in OCD. And uh, again, the reason I've got uh, so many papers is just that the one thing I can do in life is write grants. So I wrote a grant and they funded it and we started doing the work. And, uh, and the talk today really is about uh, what the intellectual background was to that grant, and uh, a little update. We haven't finished the work, we're halfway through, but a little update on where we are. So um, let's start with why we're working, or interested in psychedelics. Well, the, the reality is the world has been interested in psychedelics ever since uh, early humans started eating mushrooms and, uh, uh, and munching on bits of cacti. So this slide here shows you the, um, which, is it better if I speak like this? Yeah, okay, I'll come over here. Um, so you see, going from the top left, you see a whole range of different psychedelics. There's, there's mescaline from various cacti, including peyote, magic mushrooms, 200 species all around the world, which uh, make psilocybin. And there you see the earliest human record of the use of a psychedelic is the Algerian mushroom man, uh, a, a wall carving. So they were widely used... Um, Certainly, that's 5,000 years BCE. Ayahuasca, you've all heard of that. That's a drinkable form of DMT. A really quite a sophisticated pharmacological cocktail of two plants, one of which has DMT, and one of which has something that allows you to drink DMT because it blocks the breakdown of DMT in the gut and the liver. Bottom right, you have a different kind of psychedelic, which I won't talk about today, the muscarinic, um, muscimol psychedelic called Amanita muscaris. But again, just to prove it's been around for a long time, there's a, there's a Roman mosaic showing you how to make mushroom tea. And, uh, and then on the bottom left, you've got morning glory and ergot. And these are two separate species of plants and fungi which make lysergic acid derivatives. And... Um, and the bottom left is perhaps the most important one. So that's the Greek god Demeter, uh, and uh, she's partaking of a cocktail of ergot and wine, which I've never tried, but I, I think it was probably very popular 3,000 years ago, uh, because for about 
for about 1,500 years, the ancient Greeks used that cocktail. They called it the Kikion. Um, and I guess that fits with the caves you were talking about there, David. You know, it's, uh, it's probably good for your gut as well as for your brain because it, the ancient Greeks used to celebrate the arrival on the, on the rye and, the, and other cereals of ergot. They thought it was part of the plant. They didn't realize it was an infection. Of course, it comes in the autumn. Uh, in fact, a lot of these come in the autumn. Those of you who are into magic mushrooms know it's a good season shortly. And um, <laughs> the Greeks celebrated the ergot uh, by combining it with alcohol as part of their Eleusinian mysteries. And these were celebrations of, of dance uh, and music and theater and poetry, which uh, you know, were extremely popular, as they ran for, for maybe a thousand years uh, annually, and probably underpinned a lot of the creativity that we know uh, emerged from ancient Greece. Uh, and my view is that the, after these, uh, these slightly hedonistic but very creative festivals, the, the, the Greeks went back to their city-states and got back to doing the things that we mostly think about as being the or, uh, what originated from, from ancient Greece, which are things like the art of, um, of philosophy and uh, geometry and logic, and also democracy. And it, given that we're just inches away from the British Museum here, you can go and, if you want to afterwards, you can go and see the relics of those cultures, which eff effectively underpin uh, most of Western thought. And again, it's no coincidence that David, in his talk, he showed you several images which could be ancient Greece 3,000 years ago in terms of the building, uh, and we still uh, consider them to be central in many ways to our philosophy today. So, so psychedelics have been around for a very long time. In fact, we're one of the very few cultures that's actually tried to get rid of them. And the reasons for that I'll just touch on in a minute. So the, the big recent breakthrough in terms of psychedelics came with this man, Albert Hoffman, who was um, trying to improve on the ergot-derived lysergic acid derivatives which have been used for many hundreds of years, particularly by natural healers. Uh, ergot was used to help stop the bleeding in childbirth. It was used to help um, the letdown of milk in childbirth. And it was, of course, it was also used to uh, deal with migraines. And uh, he wanted to improve on the um, activity of lysergic acid as a, 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 a vascular um, ho uh, hormone, and he modified it and made lysergic acid diethylamide, which turned out to make, uh, which we call LSD, and uh, that ends, turned out to be an extraordinarily potent, um, the most potent, really, of all the psychedelics. And he realized then that actually most of the uh, psychedelics that were known, apart from the Amanita, were actually variants of LSD, or they all were variants, in, really, of serotonin. There he is at 100 and he used LSD on a regular basis, probably in the midi doses I'm going to talk about we're using with OCD. Uh, he, he thought it was good for his brain, and he lived to over 100 and was still quite cogent at 101 when he died. Joe Elkies was the first professor of psychiatry uh, in Britain to try this. He was professor of experimental psychiatry at Birmingham University. He lived to 103. So the idea that's been perpetuated by <coughs> organizations like the CIA that LSD will fry your brain and damage your longevity is probably untrue, but we need some better studies, but at least we've got some anecdotes there. Now, because Hoffman wrote very compellingly about his experience, and it coincided with the uh, remarkable uh, writings of people like Aldous Huxley, who used mescaline and then LSD, uh, <clears throat> and because at the time, in the 50s, we didn't have any proper treatments, targeted specific treatments in psychiatry, LSD became extremely widely used. And subsequently, uh, so did psilocybin. They were both made by um, the company Sando, and they let them out to psychiatrists all over the world if they um, considered them reputable enough to do sensible research. And they were used for various reasons. They were used to model psychosis. Uh, they were used uh, to help mental health professionals understand what it might be like to be a patient who had altered forms of consciousness. And, but largely they were used in psychotherapy. And there were two kinds of psychotherapy. There was psychedelic psychotherapy, which is mostly what we do today, which is give someone a big trip 
out of which they come changed and, uh, and can often sort of put behind them the, the problems of depression or uh, anorexia, etc. And then there was psycholytic psychotherapy, and that's, uh, that was more favoured in Britain, and that was using a low, non-psychedelic dose, but a dose that loosens up people's uh, ability to restrain their um, thinking. And, and at this lower dose, what I would call, I'm going to call a midi dose for the rest of my talk, is the dose that uh, was used to break down resistance in psychotherapy in the 50s, and is what we're using today in our um, OCD trial. And by the way, the reason we're using a midi dose, not a maxi dose or a mega dose, is because um, our patients said, we don't want to have a trip. We don't want to lose control. And I guess those of you who are in the audience, I guess many of you have got OCD, probably sympathize with that. Uh, the, the truth is, we don't know which is better, but obviously we do what our, our patients wanted us to do, so we're using this midi dose. Um, and uh, I'll share with you that study and the outcomes in a minute. Now, because we had no other treatments in the 50s and 60s, and the psych LSD in particular was extremely powerful and massively funded, particularly by the National Institutes of Health in the States, they, uh, there was a revolution in knowledge. You see there, there were a thousand clinical papers published from 1953 to 1960 and into the 70s on psychedelics. 40,000 patients, 40 books six international conferences, and in 1971, two years after the U.S. government banned them, Masters and Houston collated all the data and came to the conclusion that these were safe and effective treatments. But they were banned, and they were banned because the use of psychedelics was associated with the anti-Vietnam War protest, and it was also associated with changes in music and arts, uh, and, but in particular, and the most important image here, well, the top left shows you the impact of the ban. Uh, I don't know if I can... Just, but here you see the r number of papers each year published on LSD, the number of papers each year published on psilocybin, and then you see the ban, the American ban. Two years later, the world banned it because America controlled the UN. And you see the almost complete loss of outputs uh, as a result of the ban. And there were two reasons for the loss of outputs. The first was the US government ceased to fund any research, and it's only last year as it actually started funding psychedelic research again, and they funded almost all the research up to that point. And second reason is if you could get hold of philanthropic money, which is actually what underpins pretty much all the psychedelic research we still do today, you couldn't get the drug because the FDA and, and in Britain the, the CSM would stop you, or make it very difficult for you to have access. But on the right-hand side, you, hear, you see the real problem with psychedelics. The problem as seen by the US government was it was supporting the anti-Vietnam War movement. And there's nothing more terrifying to a government than that placard, drop acid, not bombs. Because bombing was the uh, way in which uh, foreign policy was conducted then by America, by us. And sadly, to some extent, it still is. Now, of course, the anti-war protests succeeded the Vietnam War ended, but uh, the ban on psychedelics hasn't been reversed, and it still exists in every country in the world today. They're still illegal, with one exception, but I wouldn't recommend you go there to get them because that's North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> now, despite the ban, um, there has been some progress in understanding the nature of the, these drugs in terms of pharmacology and, uh, and neuroscience. On the left-hand side here, you see a graph with four, the four main serotonergic psychedelics. Here's, here you've got mescaline, DMT, psilocybin, and LSD. And this line here is the line that shows the relationship between the dose you use and the affinity, the stickiness of these uh, different molecules for the serotonin 2A receptor. And you see there's a very strong relationship, and that tells us that these drugs all work on the same serotonin receptor. It's the, there are 15 serotonin receptors in the brain. This one is a really important receptor, not just because it's the target for psychedelics, but also because it's massively expressed in the most recently evolved parts of the human brain. So this is a, a, a brain, uh, a slice of the brain, it's a brain scan showing the density of these receptors, these 5-HC2A receptors. And you see there almost n none of them in the sub 
cortical reasons and a very high expression in this, this posterior and anterior cingulate and anterior frontal cortex regions. Much lower levels in the motor, sensory motor cortex and in the visual cortex. And that has two implications. The first is psychedelics don't interfere with what you might call primary necessary processes like breathing and heart rate and seeing and moving. The second implication is why are there so many of these receptors in the most recently evolved parts of the brain, the parts of the brain that make you human, the parts of the brain which essentially generate this amazing ability of humans to create and think and imagine and, uh, and communicate. And we don't know why they are there. Some people believe, and we've just got a paper coming out quite shortly in the journal Brain, arguing that maybe these receptors actually drive the expansion of the human brain particularly in these uh, very high uh, human uh, facilities. Um, but what's sure is that they're the target of psychedelics. And there are people, of course, who believe that they're there so we can benefit from psychedelics. That's a, a slightly more controversial and, uh, and challenging theory, hard to prove. But there's no doubt psychedelics affect the parts of the brain which are particularly relevant to the human state of consciousness. And in, in the brain, if we look in depth into the brain, we see that psychedelics work on a, a particular group of neurons in the brain, these so-called layer five pyramidal cells. And these are the neurons which connect the brain together. Your brain yeah, has probably 50 billion of these cells in your cortex. And the reason your brain is the most po more powerful, every brain here in this room is more powerful than all the computers on earth put together, because you've got 50 billion computers linked together. And uh, <laughs> the linking is driven by these layer five pyramidal cells. They're the ones that connect the brain together. And uh, for reasons, again, we don't fully understand, but I think it's got something to do with learning and insight and thinking. If you stimulate these receptors, you profoundly change the firing of these neurons. And if you do that, your brain changes, your thinking changes, and that's what a psychedelic experience is. And uh, that alteration of activity in the brain, we can visit uh, an image very powerfully using different techniques. This is a technique which I find most compelling. These are what I call brain prints. So these show the activity of uh, brains under different drugs. This particular uh, axis here, the, the, the different rows, are the different uh, frequencies of electric activity in the brain. You've probably heard about slow wave sleep, etc. Uh, and that's sleep which occurs with these very low frequency waves. Well, the MEG is just a more precise way of measuring changes in frequency. And the color coding here is important. The color coding here, if it's blue, it means that in those frequencies, there's less power. The brain is less in those frequencies. And if it's red, it means there's more power. The brain is more in these frequencies. So here's an example, for instance. If you, uh, if you put someone into an anesthetized state with propofol there, the brain becomes ultra-synchronized, which is what you want in an anesthetized state. You don't want it doing anything other than breathing. You've actually effectively switched off your cortex. But psychedelics are very different. Psychedelics produce this powerful desynchronization of the brain. We call it the entropic brain state. And it's a unique state that allows things to change. It allows the brain to escape from its un ongoing processes. And here is a, a rather beautiful, this has almost become a meme for this, uh, these, this research. So this is a a data, these two images contain the same amount of data, 7,200 connections in each. But you see on the, on the right hand side, uh, the left hand side, the placebo, most of the connections are around the edge. And that's why your brain is not just an amazingly powerful computer, but it, your brain is 10 times more efficient than any computer we've made today. And that's because your brain does computing in a different way to our normal computers, but it does it in what we call the small world fashion, that, that most, of the, most of the activity in your brain is around the edge. So the auditory cortex talks to the auditory cortex, the visual cortex to the visual cortex. Of course, if you see a bus bearing down on you, 
you've got to move your legs to get out of the way. So there's got to be some crosstalk. But the efficiency of the human brain comes from it downloading almost all the programs, all the activity into these re uh, specific regions. Now that is fantastic because, I mean, everyone in this room understands the words I, I've said because you've been brought up to know the context and the meaning of each word. So that's, that learning is deeply entrenched and very, therefore it's very efficient. However, just what happens in cases like depression and OCD is that an aberrant thought or an aberrant uh, behavior becomes downloaded in the, with the same efficiency. And as those of you with OCD know, it can be very, very difficult to break that thought process or break that behavioral process. So what gives the, the human brain this phenomenal efficiency can, in some cases, lead to problems. Now under psychedelics, the mediators, the brain processes which segregate that activity are broken down and the brain becomes much more connected. In fact, the brain under a psychedelic is like the brain of a baby, when all connections are possible. And one theory of development is that you, the whole process of development in education is to take a brain where everything's possible and turn it into a brain where essentially everything is programmed. So that's a bit of the background of psychedelics. I want to introduce why I moved from brain imaging, which is really the first question I asked about psychedelics. I didn't expect to be doing clinical treatment. I was just interested to know what the psychedelic state was. I wanted to do it before I died, and because um, no one else was doing it. So having done those, those studies, we then explored the question of, we came to an idea that maybe psychedelics, those brain imaging studies, might help us understand uh, depression and be able to treat depression. And the reason, there are two reasons we moved into depression. The first is that one of the clear impacts of psychedelics on the brain is to dampen down activity in this frontal part of the brain, switching off this region called the CG25, or subgenual cingulate cortex. Now, this is an image from our paper in 2012. By that time, we had known from all sorts of different studies, whether you're giving drugs, whether you're giving CBT, even if you're getting better on placebo, recovery from depression is associated with and probably requires a dampening down of that activity. That's one of the drivers for depressive thinking. So we thought, wow, well, you know, um, maybe if we can switch it off just like that with a psychedelic, maybe we could lift depression just like that. And the other reason, and this is particularly relevant uh, in relation to OCD now, to, is that it became quite clear 15 years ago, there's a circuit in the brain we call the default mode circuit. And, and this is a, a network which goes from the frontal cortex, this is the front of the brain here, uh, it, this is the posterior cingulate cortex, and these are two lateral regions. This network is the network in which you do your thinking about yourself. And it's called the default mode because when you're doing nothing but just thinking about yourself, you're not moving, you're not listening, you're not seeing, that's the dominant network. It's the network in which you are uh, a process, where your past, your future, your present is uh, working. Psychedelics completely disrupt the default mode network. And that's why people have strange experiences. That's why some of our volunteers and patients disappear. They go into another dimension, they go to another place, they go to heaven, etc. Because we, it complete, psychedelics break down that, the process of keeping you embedded in the current and the present. Now that's hugely relevant to depression because in depression we know that the default mode is overactive. Depressed people engage more of their brain compared with controls in this self-referential internalized thinking. And that, we call that rumination. Depressed people continually think uh, thoughts about them, uh, themselves, about them being guilty, about having made mistakes. So there's a strong relationship between the activity of the default mode, the activity of the subgenual cingulate, and rumination. So we thought, well, too much default mode depression. We can destroy the default mode temporarily with a psychedelic. Maybe that would have depression. 
So how do we do it? And, and this is relevant to what I'm going to tell you about the OCD work as well. So the process is, is quite complicated, and there are different stages. The first stage is working out whether people are eligible, whether they're healthy enough, whether they're on drugs which will block the effects, etc. And if people are eligible, then they come into a, to the clinic and they go through a period of what we call preparation. And that preparation is about explaining to people what will happen during a trip, but most, more importantly, how they will be protected if the trip is challenging. And I have to be clear about this. In depression, uh, most people have challenging trips because most people revisit traumas which have led to depression. Often traumas they've been repressing for, for years or decades. So they, they're prepared for that. They're encouraged to go into the experience and they know they will be safe because there will always be the, the therapist or guides present with them. The dosing day, they have the psilocybin or the other psychedelic and they go wherever they've got to go. We don't do therapy. We just let them go where they want to go. If they want to talk, they can talk, but mostly they don't. Mostly they just explore their past and their future and, and the interesting places that they can or get to in there through the trip. It's the next day, the follow-up day, when we do what we call integration. We help, they talk about the experience and we try to make sense of it and use it, help them use it to get the maximum benefit uh, in the long term. And then ideally in, in, in the real world you'd carry on having uh, psychotherapy integration subsequently. In our research studies we don't have resources to do that but we encourage people to go back to their therapists and, and carry on engaging. And actually quite a lot of the depressed people have set up their own support groups because it's, it turns out it's quite difficult uh, to explain the experience of a psychedelic trip to uh, people who haven't had it. So they, they find it m m more helpful to, to have people who've been through the experience supporting them. So what do we know clinically? Well, this is the very first study that we did. Uh, it shows the powerful impact of just a single trip to massively reduce depression scores. And these were people who'd all failed on at least two antidepressants. Some had failed on 10. They'd all failed on CBT. And look, they all got better. And some are still well. Some are still well now, 10 years later. The majority aren't. The majority, the depression's crept back because depression, particularly if it's been established in, in childhood, can uh, almost become the sort of default position of the brain. But nevertheless, that single, in, single treatment here is the most powerful intervention in resistant depression ever been. And it's been replicated now. This is Johns Hopkins showing powerful effect in depression. This is a complete replication from a, a compass pathway showing the same dose, the 25 milligram psilocybin dose we used, produces again a, a powerful reduction in depression scores which persist with a, a quarter of people in remission uh, 12 weeks later, whereas non-psychedelic doses don't pr produce um, that enduring benefit. And just last month, this paper came out from the States in depression showing, here you see, you've got a seven week it's a six-week period where psilocybin producers are a profound and enduring uh, reduction in depression. So, again, uh, it's remarkable that one single trip can massively change people's act lives in terms of depressive mood. What's going on? Well, we ask our patients, of course, and they often use computer analogies. They say things like, it was when you defragged the hard drive of your computer. I experienced blocks going into place, things being rearranged in my mind. I visualized as it was all put into order. And I thought, my brain is being defragged. How brilliant is that? And many also talk about basically running a virus check or reformatting the hard drive. Another patient, my outlook has changed significantly. I'm more aware now it's pointless to get wrapped up in endless negativity. I feel as if I've seen a much clearer picture. And I highly recommend the narratives in this particular um, paper are, are extremely moving. Now, you may know that there's a lot of interest in psychedelics for other disorders. There are, there are studies going on, not just in depression, but end-of-life anxiety and, and, and depression, in smoking quitting, in alcoholism, in generalized anxiety disorder, and, of course, OCD. And I want to just emphasize, this, isn't, this doesn't seem to... It's obvious why psychedelics could work across so many different disorders. But we believe the explanation is that these are all internalizing disorders. They're all disorders where people get locked into thought loops 
that they often know are ridiculous. So you do, most of you with OCD know you resist your thinking because you know it's wrong. In depression, depression is a slightly harder and more evil disorder in the sense that often depression makes you believe uh, that the thought loops are correct and you are worthless. But in addiction, people get locked into obsessions with the, um, the drug or the drink. If we can break those thought loops, we theorize, then we could potentially help people escape from these disorders. And just, just to give you an, uh, a, a schematic as to what we think is going on, and this will apply across all those disorders. In disorders like depression, we know that the energy landscape of the brain is very stratified. You have deep lows, and you have troughs, and you have high mountains. And the analogy I like to use is those thinking processes, a bit like living in Switzerland. If you live in Switzerland, you can be in a, a valley and speak French and not know that the valley over the other side, they speak German because you can't get out of the valley. Depressive thinking is in a, in a, can get into a deep rut. So you never ever, or at least for, it's very hard to think differently at all. Now, the psychedelic state we can show from brain imaging studies completely flattens the energy landscape of the brain. I showed you that with that desynchronization MEG study, that's that entropic brain. That flattening of the landscape uh, allows people to think differently, and I should explain that to you. Now, we don't scan our patients during the trip. We think that would be counter-therapeutic. It's actually not very pleasant to have your head in a, a washing machine for five hours. So, we scan them the day after or a few weeks after, and we've discovered you know, t t remarkably that the energy landscape of the brain is less stratified. It's, it's, there's less, it's less differentiated at three weeks after a single trip. And that correlates with a sense of well-being and clinical outcome. So it is a, it is a reset. And uh, I won't go into this. But this is the proof of the reset here with psilocybin. But I just want to say this about... We did the first ever study comparing psilocybin for depression with an SSRI for depression, escitalopram. And escitalopram does not reset the brain. What it does is it dampens down stress responses in a way which has been established through many other, other um, SSRI and antidepressants. And the, so we're very clear now that psychedelics and SSRIs work very differently. It's not just that psychedelics are faster at doing the same thing. They do quite different things. And I'll just prove that here for you. One of the, the way we currently think about how SSRIs work, and this will be relevant to OCD as well, is that they dampen down emotional responding. And you can see that here. So we generate emotional activity in the brain by showing people faces, particularly happy faces and scared faces. And you can see that escitalopram reduces activity in the brain to happy faces and to fearful faces and to neutral faces. It blunts emotional responding, which is good if you're anxious, but it's not good if you want to engage emotionally with other people. So there is a cost of being on SSRIs, which is very often people lose um, the ability to be as happy as they were before. Nevertheless, they're effective, but they're working in a completely different way to psychedelics. So just before I just finish with telling you about the OCD study, I just want to throw in this wonderful quote from George Bernard Shaw. Those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And what we have seen in depression, uh, and I think we're seeing now in, in anorexia, is that psychedelic treatments change the minds of patients through changing their brains. And what we've got to do is we've got to change the public's minds, which is one of the reasons I'm keen to be talking to you here, and also politicians' minds. And that's actually quite difficult. Changing politicians' minds is a lot more challenging than changing the public's minds, as I've learned to my cost. However, the minds of the Australian regulators has been changed. And in Australia, psilocybin is now available for treatment-resistant depression on the grounds of compassionate use. The, the risks of making it available are seen as trivial, because they're very safe. And the benefits, particularly in terms of helping people who've got chronic trauma disorders, chronic depression, and at high risk of suicide are seen as very advantageous. And it's very likely in America that these will be uh, approved as medicines in a few years. And the one th I like this cartoon because it shows that mushrooms are bipartisan. Both the Republicans and the Democrats are very in favor of mushrooms. Okay, so why 
might this be of interest in OCD? Well, as you all know, uh, OCD is a disorder where it's very hard to stop doing or stop thinking the thoughts you've got. What you may not know is actually OCD was the very first disorder to be characterized using neuroimaging as having a brain substrate. This is so old that this actually was done before we even had MRI studies, which is what we use now. This is an old PET study. And it shows from this group at UCLA that there's increased activity between the frontal cortex and part of the, limbic, uh, the motor system, the, the, the striatal system. Increased activity in um, people with OCD. And more recently, this group here, I don't know if there's anyone from Naomi Feinberg's group here. Or, yeah, so they showed that in this paper here that these frontal parts of the brain here uh, are the parts of the brain which are necessary to change behavior. And in this particular uh, test, which I'm going to show you in a minute because we're using it in, in our patients now, this particular test requires people to think differently, to change the way that, to change the rules in which they're behaving. And it uh, turns out that people with OCD struggle in this test. And this particular paper is very important because it showed that the, the reason they struggle is they don't have enough activity in the parts of those parts of the brain which allow them to change their thinking. But you'll also know that this, notice here that some of the problem may also be in these parts which I showed you previously of the default mode. The other really interesting thing, and one of the reasons I was, I've always been intrigued by OCD is that this early imaging literature showed very clearly, it was the first ever disorder where we could measure a change in the brain as a result of psychotherapy, as well as drug treatment. Whether patients with OCD got better on SSRIs or got better on CBT, the same changes occurred. There was a dampening down of these connections between the frontal part of the brain and the chordate. And the chordate is, an, uh, is a nucleus in the basal ganglia which drives particularly repetitive motor behavior. So here's the study. We call it Silo OCD. It's, as I say, it's funded by Orchard Charity. Uh, it's a placebo-controlled, single-blind pharmacological challenge. So as I said, we're not giving people a trip, but we're giving them different doses of psilocybin, that some of which will produce alterations in their way they perceive their relationship with their their symptoms, and we're getting them to engage in this task that I showed you was um, difficult for people with OCD. This is the task, the set shifting task developed by Trevor Robbins in Cambridge, and it, the rules are very straightforward. You learn a rule, you either click on this, the, the filled shape or the open shape, and then the rule changes. You don't know when the rule changes, so you keep clicking on this shape. It gets you wrong if it, when the rules change, and you've got to click on this shape, and uh, People with OCD struggle. They keep clicking on the original learnt shape for longer. So it's a very straightforward test of cognitive flexibility. And, uh, and we're exploring whether this midi dose of psilocybin can improve cognitive flexibility in this task. But we're also discovering something very interesting, which we didn't quite expect, which is that even the non-psychedelic dose produces quite profound changes in uh, our patient's um, sense of self and, uh, and perception. I'll just show you on the next slide, but just, just so you know where we are so far, we've, got th we've had about 1,000 people expressing an interest. 20% meet the criteria for inclusion, so that's a lot of possible candidates. It's a feasibility study. We wanted to make sure it was safe. It is safe. We haven't had any adverse effects, and we're halfway through the study now. But this is a particularly interesting um, comment from one of the patients. I'm doing your trial of Silo OCD and wanted to give you thanks and convey my sincere appreciation for creating the study. It might not eradicate the illness, but my life has certainly been put onto a more favorable trajectory, one that is freer to some extent from its holding. And I think that kind of makes perfect sense with the neurobiology. Psychedelics loosen rigid thinking and that may be, well, that is definitely a necessary uh, sequel, uh, a prequel rather, to getting out of OCD, and it may well be a good stepping stone. So I'll stop now. I want to 
remind you, as you heard, I've just got a new book published on psychedelics, also recently published with David Castle, who you saw on one of the other slides about the microbiome, uh, on psychedelics in psychiatric medicine. So those are two good resources. And I want to finish, as I promised, to Orchard to thank them again for their support and remind them, and remind you all probably, that uh, we've now, they've now set up a, um, a contact registry for scientific research in OCD. And uh, I think you'll find there's a poster on it outside. Is that right? Yeah, and there's a session on it. Oh, there's a session on it as well. Okay, so I imagine Nick will turn up. And if Nick's not here, is anyone else from Orchard here? Uh, okay, because I got a book for him. But um, <laughs> if he doesn't come, I'll leave it with He's here. you. He's here. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Nutt. That was absolutely wonderful. Wasn't it inspiring to see and hear what is on its way and what will become?